series pretty soon and I usually like to uh, give the shop a good cleanup between projects. Now to this point in the podcast we've begun to lay the foundation of a well-equipped hand tool shop. We've talked about what tools make up a good starter set. Uh, we've sharpened just about everything under the sun. We've even talked about some basic layout and sawing skills to get us started. We're well on our way to getting started building some furniture. But before we do, we need to find a place to put all of this stuff that we've acquired and talked about in the last several episodes. We need a place to work, we need a way to organize our tools and keep them organized, and we need to have an understanding of how work is going to flow through the shop so that as we're working we can stay organized and not get in our own way. Now this is especially important in a small space like my own. So today I want to spend a little bit of time talking about setting up and organizing this shop. Now you've pretty much seen my entire shop piecemeal already in previous podcasts, but today I'll give you a formal tour and show you how I've addressed some of the common issues that every shop faces. Now keep in mind that I've addressed these issues in a way that I think is best for myself, my own personal space and style of work. You'll most likely have to come up with different solutions to fit your own style of work and your own space. What I hope to do in today's episode isn't to show you the best way to solve these problems, but instead to get you thinking about how you need your space set up for the type of work that you do and the way that you prefer working, and get you thinking about how you can best address these issues in your own space. So one of the first things that every woodworker needs is a place to work. Besides looking really strange, Trying to saw or hand clean lumber in midair can be kind of dangerous, unless you're a member of the Expert Village team of pros. But luckily I'm not, so here on the north wall of my uh, shop is where I have my workbench. Now keep in mind, you can make your workbench as simple or complex as you want. It could be something as simple as a solid core door screwed to a couple of uh, wooden sawhorses, or as complex as a, a European cabinet maker's bench with a laminated top and a trestle base and a, a shoulder vise similar to the one Frank Klaus prefers. Really it's up to you how simple or complex you want your bench to be. But do keep one thing in mind. It's a workbench. You're going to be working on it. So as I've said in previous podcasts, don't overanalyze it. And if you really don't feel up to building your own workbench, there's really no shame in buying one. There are plenty out there that are perfectly capable of doing great work. So let's take a look at my workbench and we'll talk a little bit about the things that I like about it and what I think could use a little bit of improvement based on the style of work that I do. Now the top of my workbench is just a few inches over seven feet long. Now you may think that this is a relatively longer bench, but in actuality there are times when I wish it was ten feet long. Realistically, I would say that an 8 foot bench would cover 90 to 95 percent of the work that I do. Unfortunately, when I built this bench, the lumber that I had, I was limited to a 7 foot top. If I did have it to do over again, I would have used more of the lumber that I had, made the top a little bit longer, probably about 8 feet, and went out and got some more lumber for the base. The top is made up of laminated sections of birch. This makes it very heavy and relatively stiff. These are good things when it comes to a workbench for hand tool work. However, the birch also has a few drawbacks as well. One major drawback of having a very hard wood bench top um, is that the top itself is harder than most of the furniture woods that I work with. What this means is that on occasions when I accidentally drop a piece of the furniture or bang it into the bench, the furniture wood dents before the bench does, 
which is not such a good thing and has caused me to have to remake parts several times and not real happy about that. Uh, the other drawback of a very hardwood bench top is that hardwood tends to polish and burnish more than a softwood bench does. So when you're flattening and planing this top, it's going to take on a much smoother, much more burnished surface. Uh, what this in turn means is that there's less friction between the pieces that you're working in the bench top, so your work pieces tend to slide around more. Uh, softer wood bench tops like spruce or dub fir or poplar tend to have a rougher texture to them um, and they grip the wood a little bit more. Now most workbenches have some sort of face vise. Um, I built this wooden screw twin screw vise and it's really uh, probably my favorite type of vise that I've ever worked with. I really like it because I can clamp case sides up to 18 inches wide between these screws without any interference underneath. Um, you, know, you can easily build your own vise, your own face vise if you like, um, or there are plenty of commercial types of vices out there that you can use as well. Many benches will have a tail vise down on this end of the bench. Um, as you can see, I did have one here at one point. Um, I wasn't very fond of it. I really didn't like using it, and therefore I didn't use it very often. So um, I did remove it and sell it. Um, I do have plans to either rebuild this bench top at some point, or at least replace the front six inches or so to fill in this space. In the front edge of the bench top are dog holes for square wooden bench dogs. I rarely use these anymore though since removing the tail vise. I also have several holes bored for hold fasts. These are simple work holding devices that can quickly hold parts firmly to the bench top and just as quickly release them with just a solid whack from a mallet. I also use the front hold fast hole for a dowel that I use as a planing stop. The base of the bench is a traditional trestle design with feet and top stretchers. After using this bench for some time now, I've come to the conclusion that this style of base is not the most friendly for a hand tool only shop. The legs are set back from the front edge of the top which prevents me from clamping work to them. In addition, the feet prevent me from adjusting the height of the bench, which I feel I need to make about four inches shorter than it currently is. The sliding board jack is also set back from the front edge, which reduces its effectiveness at supporting long boards on edge, as it was intended for. A feature of the base that I do like is the shelf. This gives me always needed extra storage space for long bench planes, appliances, and sharpening stones. I also store some items that just don't fit well anywhere else here under the bench on the floor. These are things like a small bin for short lumber cutoffs, a carving jack, and my hand cranked bench grinder. Now because my shop is only about 100 square feet, floor space is really at a premium, so I don't really have a lot of room for traditional a uh, cabinet maker's type tool chest that sits on the floor or, or a standing chest on the floor. Um, but because I only have this one small window in the shop, I do have plenty of wall space. In fact, I have almost three times as much wall space as I have floor space. So as you can see behind me, I've taken that wall space and used it to my advantage to store my tools. Now for most of my tools, I made these tool boards. Um, they're only about an inch and a half deep, so they can store just as much, pretty much, as the wall can hold without taking up a lot of depth. Um, they're hung on French cleats so that I can remove them from the wall anytime I need to if I want to reconfigure them or move them around the shop at all. Um, and because they're made of solid wood, I can make custom-made tool holders or pegs and put them anywhere on the board that I want unlike something like a, a gypsum wall board or cinder block wall where you're really limited to where you can put in any type of um, racks or storage for your tools. So this was a solution that I came up with that I saw in a magazine article several years ago um, that has really worked out well for me. Now up above the tool boards on this side of the window, I have a shelf that I made to hold my molding and joinery planes. 
the shelf was made so that it is just the depth of the planes themselves so that it takes up no more room than is required to store the planes. Uh, I do have to confess that I did steal the bracket design from pictures of Adam Carabini's shop, uh, but I didn't get the proportions just right when I cut them out, so mine don't look as nice as his. Uh, but I am all about function when it comes to stuff for the shop, and the shelf functions great. Similarly, uh, just about a couple years ago, I guess, I built this wall cabinet here to store all of my finishes and solvents and glues. Um, it is only about five and a half inches deep, so it doesn't take up a lot of space, but it does provide plenty of storage space and gets the dangerous chemicals and solvents up off the floor and out of the hands of my toddlers. Over here on the south wall, I have uh, a full wall length French cleat that I hung here that allows me to, again, make custom tool holders that I can use to hang all sorts of different tools that may not fit over by the workbench. Um, this wall is also where I keep my Roy Underhill design spring pole lathe. Um, and I do have to confess that I did build this earlier this year, but I haven't got a whole lot of time to use it yet, so uh, I'm not very good at it just yet. I also keep a metal trash can over here in this corner. Um, I like metal because it will contain any accidental fire that may start inside the can, whereas a plastic can may just melt and burn the whole house down. Over here on the south wall is where I keep what little lumber I have on hand. Um, lumber storage is a very big consideration for uh, any shop space. Full length and full width boards can take up a lot of room very quickly. So for just this reason, I don't keep a lot of lumber on hand. Um, in fact, I actually prefer to buy my lumber specific to the project that I'm working on. So typically in my shop, what you'll see are off cuts and just the occasional piece of lumber that I have left over from another project. But usually I won't have to store very much lumber. Um, having it up high on the wall here keeps it out of the way. It's not the most convenient place to store it. It can be a little awkward to get wide heavy boards off the top shelf, um, but it does keep it up and out of the way and saves valuable floor space for me. I uh, keep my saw bench and my shave horse along the south wall as well. Um, keeps it out of the way and I can use the saw bench as a step to get to the lumber on the top rack and then step right back down and get the lumber over to my bench. I also keep my desk here over on the south wall opposite my workbench. Uh, it's in a convenient spot so that I can leave a book open while I'm working on a piece for reference. Um, and then you notice I also use the support for the lumber rack to store some other extra tools and patterns that I have up here. Here on the east wall is where I keep what few clamps that I have um, also my dust collection system over here, um, as well as a uh, workbench for my kids. Lighting is another important consideration for any shop space. Now obviously we want the shop to be nice and bright so that we can see what we're doing, but we don't want it flooded with so much light that we need to wear sunglasses every time we come in. Uh, now it has been said before that the best light for most woodworking is natural light from a, a window or skylights. And while this is true, a lot of shops just don't have uh, that luxury. Um, now I will, I have been known to work without any artificial lights on when I have the time to work during the day and the sun is right. Um, it is actually a very nice way to work. But just like anyone else, I do most of my work after hours, when it's dark, and I don't have the luxury of that natural light. So we do have to light the shop artificially. Um, Fluorescent lighting is what I use. It's not the most ideal. Um, I'm still searching really for the best lighting option for my shop. Uh, but for the time being, you know, I use some 3500K temperature uh, tubes in the fluorescent, which seem to help a little bit, but it still has that bluish tinge to it. Uh, and it's just not the best light for detail work because it tends to flood everything and not create any shadows. Um, so for that type of work, I also have a clamp light 
that I can position either on you know one wall or the other so that I can provide raking light across the workbench. And this is for doing carving or joinery work or any type of detail work where having raking light and shadow really helps. So the last thing I want to talk about today is comfort in the shop. Now woodworking is an activity that requires you to spend a lot of time on your feet. And for those of us who have desk jobs and slightly less than ideal BMIs, uh, this can really be hell on your feet and your joints. So a really important addition to every shop is an anti-fatigue mat. These help to cushion your feet and your back and your joints and to help make it more comfortable to stand at your bench for long hours. Um, it helps make your work enjoyable rather than agonizing. Really, no shop should be without at least one of these in front of the workbench. So that's my shop. I hope you enjoyed the tour and maybe even got an idea or two that you can use in your own shop. So hopefully you come back next time because um, we're going to talk about some of the aids and fixtures and appliances that you see hanging around the shop and under the bench on different pegs and shelves. Um, I use these things on almost a daily basis when I'm in the shop, so they're very valuable to have around the shop. The best part is you can make them yourself. No need to buy anything except the wood. Uh, so come on back next time and we'll talk about those things. Uh, as always, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to shoot me an email at logancabinetshop at verizon.net. Thanks again. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.